force northwestwards to find and defeat the Turks. Through the spring floods of 1915, between and along the great rivers, the army labored slowly forward towards Baghdad. In country where an army must provide for itself, everything had to be improvised. Transport, medical care, hospitals. It was the rainy season when the rivers were in flood. For transport, the British used small native boats called bellums. Gunboats protected the advance just as they had protected Kitchener's advance up the Nile in 1898. But unlike Kitchener, the British were not building a railway line behind them. By June, the army was at Amara, 200 miles away from its base at Basra. So far, the Turks had been beaten easily. Should the British press on, Nixon asked the government at home for instructions. The government were dazzled by the easy successes, by the name of Baghdad. They told Nixon to march on if he thought the risks acceptable. Ever optimistic, Nixon ordered the force commander, General Townsend, to advance. Townsend, too, was a man with Napoleonic aspirations. While his troops marched or rested or battled with the flies and mosquitoes, he decided to try a stroke of daring. I told Sir John Nixon that if I routed the Turks in battle, I might follow them into Baghdad. The political officer told me that if I went into Baghdad, it would have almost the same political importance as if I were to enter Constantinople. The news would go through all Asia. Constantinople, Baghdad, cities of legend. The lure of Baghdad blinded soldiers and politicians alike to the squalid reality of 20th century Mesopotamia in midsummer, to the weakness of the link with far off Basra. A link strained to breaking point by the hordes of filthy and hungry refugees who were fleeing from the iron clamor of a foreigner's war. It was 1915, the summer of the battles of Artois and Neuve Chapelle in France. The sun glared down on the troops round Amara. Water that teemed with germs of every kind had to be purified before it could be safely drunk. And in the heat, men and beasts craved for water. The day temperature reached 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Disease swept the army. With contaminated water came dysentery and cholera. With the rats and the lice came plague and typhus. With the insects came sandfly fever and mosquito-borne malaria. Above all, there was the crushing, annihilating heat. I had malaria and I was looking in this window at the back of me, a room full of young men, great strong young fellows, all dying slowly of heat stroke. Further and further up the turgid rivers, further and further into the heat and emptiness, Townsend's men advanced. Now Townsend himself began to feel qualms. 
the army commander does not seem to realize the weakness and danger of his line of communications. We are now some 380 miles from the sea. With the capture of Kut El Amara, just another Arab mud town on the river, Townsend halted to rest and build up supplies. Back in Basra, Nixon was still confident. He telegraphed to India. I consider I am strong enough to open the road to Baghdad. November 1915. Once more, Tanzen's weary men plodded north along the river. Behind them ambled a transport column that belonged not to the 20th century, but to the campaigns of Alexander or Xerxes. 620 camels, 240 donkeys, a thousand mules, 660 carts, a collection of bullocks and cows, and a strange regatta of river craft. At last, Townsend came up with the main Turkish army, only 16 miles from Baghdad, but nearly 500 from Basra. The Turks lay entrenched in the plain, where only the great ruined arch of the ancient palace of Tessiphon broke the flat horizons. When we come into the 300 yards mark, they opened a pretty heavy lot of shooting. Quite a lot of our fellas had got it. Got, uh, I think, but half the regiment went wiped out there on that vital point there. Well, we carried on. We captured that first line. The Turks had all gone away from it. We captured the points we was after. And they'd gone on to, to line number two. Well, we hadn't, we couldn't go on no further. It was a victory but a victory that cost nearly half the British strength in infantry. The Turks had been reinforced. Townsend was 500 miles from his base, outnumbered, cumbered with sick and wounded. He faced disaster. The army fell back. For the sick and wounded now began a journey whose horror and agony recalled the Crimea. Jolted over the rough desert in the springless, cushionless army transport carts, wounded men with broken limbs threw themselves out and crawled across the desert on hands and knees rather than endure the agony of the shaking, or use dead bodies as cushions between them and the bottom of the carts. Worse was to come. Packed into river boats, the wounded lay without medical aid for days until they reached Basra. The patients were so huddled and crowded together that they could not perform the offices of nature clear of the edge of the ship, and the whole of the ship's side was covered with stalactites of human feces. Then we found a mass of men huddled up anyhow, some with blankets and some without. They were lying in a pool of dysentery about 30 feet square, covered with dysentery and dejecta generally from head to foot. The first man I examined had a fractured thigh, perforated in five or six places. He'd apparently been writhing about on the deck. On the 3rd of December, 1915, Tanzen found shelter in the town of Kut. Soon he was cut off and besieged by the Turks. I have shut myself up in Kut. The state of extreme weariness and exhaustion of my men demands instant rest. On Christmas Eve, they got quite a number of the troops in front of us and they started at dawn on an attack. They blew different holes in our walls. They got in, we counter-attacked, drove them out again, I suppose about, well, quite half a dozen times they, they broke in at different places and we drove them out. In 
January 1916, fresh troops from...